Evan Barry is joining me to talk about the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year nominated uh, Nightboat Tangier. Uh, Kevin, how are you and, and where are you? I am looking out at very typical County Sligo rain in the northwestern zone of, of, of our island. Um, a, a kind of a typical high summer day of grey clouds and incessant rain and a, and a wonderful 13 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's, it's high, high summer here in County Sligo. Yeah, because I don't, I don't want people to think we're in completely different countries. We're in the same country and there's loads yeah. of cloud outside and it's lashing here as well. I'm just in front of a bigger window than you are. <laughs> that that explains it. You're you're more well lit today. Yeah. I need it on some days. Kevin, tell me first of all, maybe very quickly before we talk about the book, about the last four months and about how that's maybe affected your work, if at all. Yeah, I guess um, you know, I I I I think it's a very lockdown is a very different experience in rural places and in urban places. You know, in the countryside here. You know, it, the texture of the day isn't very different. I'm looking out at the same fields and the same lake and the same little green hills that I usually look out on. Um, I'm a writer, so I work from home. Um, so, so that's not affected. Um, definitely the first couple of weeks of it, I was pretty distracted, um, checking on the news lines all the time, you know, checking on the phone, what's going on. Been in that kind of vague funk of paranoia um, that we, we were all in in the very early stages of it. Um, slowly settled a bit and, uh, and I've been working away, you know, have been, have been showing up and, and going to the desk. Um, I think definitely the work will be, will be affected in, in, in kind of sidelong, in oblique ways, what comes out at the far end, even if you're not writing directly about coronavirus or if you're not writing directly sort of pandemic dystopias. Um, so it's 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 funny for someone who has written dystopias in my day, uh, when, when <laughs> they're great fun to write, you know. And then when you suddenly land in the middle of them, you think, oh god, maybe this isn't so much fun after all. Yeah, you, you can't close the book and just put it away at the uh, end of the end, okay. the end of the afternoon. Now I get that. Okay, maybe just uh, to, to begin then, for those people who haven't yet uh, read Nightboat to Tangier, uh, tell us a little bit about the story. Tell us who we're with and tell us where we are. Yeah, the, the, the novel opens in the port of Algeciras in the south of Spain, uh, where the ferries depart for Morocco, for Tangier. Uh, we find two, two Irishmen there, uh, two men from the city of Cork, from the beautiful city of Cork. Uh, they're, not, they're not the nicest characters in lots of ways. They're not the most, they're not the most pleasant and decent chaps. They're, they're, they're old drug smugglers. They're, they're gangsters kind of on their wane. They're in their early 50s. The glory days are past. Um, one of their daughters has been missing for a few years. They've heard she's about to pass through Algeciras on her way to North Africa, so they're kind of staking the place out. Um, that's the starting point for it. From there, the book's trajectory is very much into the past. It kind of tries to explain to us who, who, who these two gents are, how they've wound up in this dreadful condition that they're in. And, 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 and we go into a little bit then about, about who this girl is, who this girl Dilly is, and, and her mother Cynthia who we discover quickly enough in the novel uh, was a lady who was kind of caught between these two men. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a love triangle story, essentially. Um, it's a story about male friendship, about fraternity, um, about the way we're all unable to, to step out of the shadow of our own family past. Um, above all, I guess it's a portrait of a very strange little extended family. I love the idea, and I've heard you speak about this before, about Charlie and Morris, about how they're not new to you. They've been knocking around for, for oh, years yeah. in one form or another. They've stuck their heads in in a few places and you've just said, no, 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 you're, you're not quite right with this. Maybe tell us a little bit about how long these two guys have been, been in your head. Yeah, like they're large characters. They're very talkative. <laughs> they have plenty to say. And they were shown up for ages in, 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 in the shed out the back here where I, where I work. Um, initially, they were trying to barged their way into short stories. I'm very often trying to write a short story. Um, whenever a story was starting to flag, these two uh, talkative and, and quite stylish old Cork gangsters would show up and try to make their way into the story and would immediately destroy it because they were too large for it. Mm -hmm. um, I eventually discovered I had to tell their own story, try to figure out who they were, that these weren't just bit players, that these just weren't sort of character actors showing up. Um, I tried it in the first instance as a play. I spent a few weeks trying to write Write, write them in a, a play version of Morris and Charlie. But very quickly, the story, as I mentioned, sort of went in this trajectory into the past. 
and I kind of knew it had to be a novel initially and that it had to that it needed the space um and the lovely freedom a novel gives you the great like the great thing about a novel it's such a good tool it's it's like a hammer it's unimprovable you know it, it can do anything it can go in any direction past forwards into the future in, 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 into the, stay in the present moment um all you need to do is capture the reader and keep her on the line sentence by sentence and page by page and they'll forgive you anything if the sentences are good enough and if the pages are good enough yeah. Tell me as well, maybe a little bit about Spain's part in this, because you've been going to Spain for, for a long time yeah. and then it starts to influence maybe the, the, these guys and, and, and then where you end up setting them. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the natural light, as you can see from my gloomy cave in County Sligo, <laughs> is pinched enough at the best of times in, in, in the northwest of Ireland. In, in, in winter, it gets very dank and very dark. And for more than 20 years now, I've been uh, escaping to Spain for a little while, um, around January, February, March kind of time. Uh, some, day, some years just for a few days, sometimes for a few weeks, a couple of months if I could afford it. Um, and just kind of drifting around those southern Spanish Andalusian cities. Um, and I guess over the last few years, um, trying to figure out where, where's my Spain book, where's my Spain novel. I felt like I had a lot of texture to write about the place, um, but I, I can't, couldn't figure out how to do it until I thought, what about if I take those two cork gangsters, Morris and Charlie, and put them in Spain? I'll, I'll, I'll be away. I, I, I'll be able to get going on it then. And sometimes as a writer, when you, you're characters find their correct terrain when they find their stage you're off you know you can hear this kind of click and you're like okay that's where they're supposed to be i have the stage set for them now and we'll just see where see where it goes but i i love spain i mean after ireland it's it's it's, it's i guess it's my favorite country um it reminds me a lot of the ireland i grew up in in the in the 70s and 80s there's still a very pronounced catholic influence in just the way the streets look and the feel of the place you hear church bells all day you see nuns around the place although in a way that you don't really in irish cities anymore and it reminds me of being a kid in ireland in the 70s and and, and in the 80s um and there's, there's something you know I, I often think my stories almost always start with a place in some ways some some kind of atmosphere that a place gives out makes me want to tell some story in response to it to create some piece of art in response to the atmosphere or ambience of a, of a, of a place. You, you say that with Charlie and Morris and Spain, that, that, that there was just a moment where it all just kind of clicked together and you thought we, we might be onto a runner here. Is there a specific moment that happened to you? Do you know when, when that was? Or do you know just that it was in and around a certain time? Actually, I, 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 it, it, it was strange. In the second half of the book, the women in the story come, come true uh, much more strongly, uh, the girl Dilly, who's missing, and, and her late mother Cynthia. And it was funny. One morning, I, I was writing a very quiet scene um, where Dilly and Cynthia are having coffee in a cafe in Cork City, and Dilly just asks her mother, "Did did you ever see them violent?" You know, and it's kind of a nothing, quiet little scene. But something happened when I when I wrote that scene. It, sometimes it's like a tuning fork. You just hear this kind of ping, and you go, "That's it. That's the story." Now it's becoming the real thing. And, and, and you can write a few sentences or half a paragraph and it just seems to work like a tune and fork for the whole story. Suddenly you have the kind of tune of it. You have the melody of it. And I, I do believe that that kind of prose fiction is kind of like a disappointed musical form in lots of ways. I think <laughs> lots of novelists are failed musicians and really bad singers. You know, if, if, if I often say if I could play the piano or sing a song, I'd be fine. I wouldn't have to write <laughs> stories, but I can't. So I, so I, have, to, I have to do these... Uh, do these, do these novels instead and it's um but i do think every novel worth its salt has a kind of its own inherent melody or tune and and and, and what you're doing as a novelist is you're listening for it and you're trying to follow it along sentence by sentence cynthia and and dilly are, are crucial here i mean and, and rightly yeah. so because they make up ha half of the cast of the book but as you said yourself i mean they could very easily have been drowned out by the two main characters, they could have become almost sidebars. How tough was it to, to write them with the other two characters already almost in situ? Well, what was very interesting about them was how different they were to write than the men, because when I was writing Morris and Charlie, there's all this kind of glorious talk and dialogue going on. Um, but it seemed to me like Cynthia and Dilly as characters felt far more comfortable um, in their own skin. Um, a lot of the whole talk with Morris and Charlie seemed to be to cover up true feeling 
and to and to hide and to mask real feeling. Like it's it's interesting about Irish people and talk. You know, we're we're great talkers and we love the sounds of our own voices. God bless us. You know, but very often we're saying very little. You know, and there's so much that's buried beneath the surface of an Irish conversation. Um, and that's often as a writer, as a novelist or as a dramatist, where you find the real story in what's not been said in what's going along just underneath the surface of all our, our glorious, loquacious talk. Um, Cynthia and Dilly both felt to be much more natural in the way they presented themselves, whereas Morris and Charlie were putting on fronts and putting on airs in the way that men do often to kind of justify their whole hustle and their whole existence, you know? Interestingly, given that obviously this event is being done through through uh, the wonderful Listow Writers Week, which didn't happen this year, and because you were you were shortlisted for the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year, but this is also happening through the, the Irish Fest in, in Milwaukee as well. Mm-hmm. How how do you think that the likes of and those crucial maybe spaces in conversation, those ones that you talk about there, do you ever fear that sometimes that's something that Irish audiences will get immediately and that might not necessarily transfer to people who aren't? I don't worry about that. I, th- I, I think you can't be local enough in a story. That the, the more local your story is, the more, the more of a chance it has to become uh, a universal thing. Uh, I've, been, I've been lucky with this one in, in, in terms of how it's gone down with readers abroad. It's, it's done very well in the US. Um, God bless the New York Times, put it in their top 10 of the year thing. Thank you very much for that. It goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All oh, great. It, it really <laughs> does go a long way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I guess, for, for the untrained ear, not quite used to Cork City dialect, it might need a beat or two to tune in to the conversation for sure. But I don't think it's difficult. I think it's, it, it might take a couple of pages for the readers to tune into the conversation if they're, if they're not used to Hiberno English uh, dialect. But you'll get there. I often think when I'm watching like a great American TV show like The Wire or something like that, if, if I can learn inner city Baltimore, Patois, they can learn Cork. There's no problem, you know. Yeah. We, 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 we do have the language in common. It's just different nuances and different little intonations in it. Um, I think the tone... Uh, is what is what carries uh, dialect and local dialect through. Um, in my books, usually it's a tone of kind of very dark comedy. It's 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 kind of very inky black comedy, uh, and I th- I think that 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 makes it very kind of uh, universally understandable. Um, you've been nominated for 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 this, and you've been nominated uh, in Docky this year. You were long listed for the book of this year as well. At this stage of your career, is that all just water off a duck's back, or or, or does it still mean something? Not at all. I get a great buzz out of it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 there's nothing not to love about um, about, about being nominated for, for, for book prizes. It's a, it's a, you know, the whole thing is an awful bummer this year, the lockdown and the pandemic. It's such a shame because Listowel had a great um, anniversary coming up this year. And as you know yourself, Listowel is, is the most fun you can have at a literary festival. It's, it's, yeah. it's, just, it's just great crack. It's... It, it's um, I just, I just, I, I know that we're gonna, we, we'll make up for it next year when, when, when we get down there. We'll have, we, it'll be a very special celebration, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's always such. What I love about the Listowel Festival is that it's not just a typically literary uh, crowd that shows up. Kind of everyone turns up, you know, everyone in the town. It's the big thing going on in the town, so every, everyone comes out and shows up for it. And I've, I've been many a time over the years, and I've always had an absolute ball at the festival. Uh, real dancing in Billy Keane's pub at one in the morning or else you haven't lived. That's the whole uh, point. And, 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 and later, possibly. No, no. <laughs> who, who, who knows? <laughs> it, it is, though, and, and maybe just to briefly touch on this as well, it has been obviously an extraordinary year in, in every aspect of pretty much every life. Um, for festivals, it has been so as well. You and I had a very brief conversation just before we started here about the amount of travelling you've done this year for festivals while only sitting in exactly the same spot you've been there. That's, that's a strange one. It does. It brings it home. Like uh, last year when the, when the novel came out initially, I was, you know, I was on planes every other day and going around the place and a lot, thousands of miles in, in Ireland and in Europe and in North America. And, you know, I was kind of roughly adding it up in, in, in my head. I, I, I probably reach more people via Zoom. Uh, from my living room this year than I did all last year with all that travel. It, it does make you think about, about how much you, you really do need to do, do all these air miles and stuff in the future. It'll definitely change the way we think. Um, I give out about the internet a lot because it's such a distraction from writing, but it's so useful in terms of things like this. It's been, it's been such a cool thing to be able to stay connected to the kind of, um, 
to, to, to the book world and to the literary community and to readers this year. It, 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 it's, it's a blessing that we've had it, you know. Maybe tell me a little bit just before we finish um, about Michael Fassbender. Has he bought the rights to the book? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm working on, on, on the screenplay for Nightboat to Tangier as we speak. Um, it was optioned just after the book came out. Um, I, I, it quite naturally lends itself to, 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 to a screen adaptation, I think. So, so watch this space. I, I'm busy at it. So hope, hopefully there, there'll be something happening in the not too near future. And there's other stuff happening in the not too near future as well in that, you know, you will have another book out this year. You will have a collection of short stories coming out yeah. um, later on in the year. Tell me a little bit about uh, that old country music. Yeah, it's it's my third collection of of, of stories. Um, my last one, amazingly to me, was eight years ago now, Dark Lies the Island. Mm. But, uh, but I, I, I kind of rooted around the house and I found about, there's about 20 stories that I'd written since then. And I picked out 11 that seemed to kind of speak to each other and that seemed to resonate off each other. Most of them are set now out, out, outside the window here in the Northwest. Um, I guess it's like a musician or a band putting together an album. You look for the for the songs that kind of speak to each other and that resonate a little with each other. So it feels thematically coherent, I think. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, the, the story is kind of a first love for me, the short story form. So it's a really cool buzz. It's a very exciting thing to be, to be putting out a new collection of them. And that's coming out later this year, but uh, Night Boat to Tangier in the States, the new paperback version is coming out. Am I, do I have that right? Is that, this week, that Milwaukee. There? This week, Milwaukee. <laughs> the paperback is out. Yeah. And gorgeous looking uh, it is too. It's a nice um, looking book. Uh, again, congratulations on the, the nomination for the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year earlier this year. And uh, I, I would say congratulations on the, well, all of the conversation that's happening around this because it has been an extraordinary year for the book and for you, even if you haven't left your front room, there's been a, a bit of that that's going right. on as well. Kevin Barry, it's always a pleasure. Thanks, my friend. Thanks a million, Rick. Pleasure. Cheers.